Thank you, Cleo. Thank you, Keith, Justin. Everybody has been uh, instrumental in getting me out here up from uh, sunny Southern California in San Diego. Uh, it's a true pleasure to be here, and I'm interested in uh, sharing some ideas with you uh, that I've had for a couple of years now, but really came into sharp focus just, just about uh, three or four years ago when we made a discovery that made front page headlines around the world. And it was done in such a way as to captivate the attention of people young and old, uh, you know, of all, all, different, all different nationalities, because what it spoke to was how did the universe come to be the way that we see it today? And I'm going to talk to you about that and the concomitant intertwining with this most prestigious of all accolades on Earth, namely the Nobel Prize. And I came to encounter it, and obviously, you know, spoiler alert, I did not win the Nobel Prize. This is not real, this one over here, uh, but it's edible, and that's sometimes, you know, sometimes that's even more preferable. So I want to talk to you about how we came to make this discovery, and sort of the summary of the book can be shown in, in just one, one picture, as most things can be described. This is a picture made in Nature magazine on the occasion of my uh, book release. And it shows a telescope, our, our neighbor telescope at the South Pole, staring up to the heavens and fixated and focused in some sense on the Nobel Prize. That's a picture of uh, uh, the famous Nobel Prize rendered as if it is this, this type of heat that I study that I will talk to you about today called the cosmic microwave background radiation, the oldest light in the universe. But before we get into the pursuit of the Nobel Prize, the ultimate uh, uh, the loss of, of winning Alfred's namesake medallion, I want to explore a little bit of how the Nobel Prize came to be so venerated, so esteemed, that it really dominates headlines around the world. And I can't really you know, thank the media enough, because right now, the Nobel Prize and our fearless leader, Donald Trump, are, are, are in the news almost on an hourly basis. So we'll, we'll get to that towards the very end when I talk about some ideas that I'm proposing my book and arguments I make for a modification to society's superlative prize. So how did the Nobel Prize get to be so esteemed? Well, first, a brief history of the Nobel Prize. So the history is that Alfred Nobel's family and his father were great inventors, and they were inventors of deadly technologies. In particular, they invented landmines and sea mines during the, uh, one of the Russian wars in the mid-1800s. Uh, at some point, Tsar Nicholas decided that they were done with war in Russia, and you know that came to be true, right? There were no more war with Russia after the 1860s, right? So, but they cut all the ties to the Nobel uh, and, and Sons business, which were making these deadly munitions. And that kind of drove the older, the father, Elder Nobel, Emmanuel Nobel, crazy. And he ended up ceding control of his business to his, to his oldest son, Ludwig. In between, there was a huge boom, a building boom in the West, in particular in the United States. We were building railways, expanding them from the East Coast to the West Coast. And at that time, they needed to do, they needed some way of mass excavation, and they were using nitroglycerin, which is incredibly unstable. And in fact, if you take nitroglycerin and you drop it, it will explode, and, and that actually happened to Alfred's baby brother, Emil. So Alfred's uh, baby brother, Emil, was trying to synthesize a stable version of nitroglycerin. He failed miserably. Unfortunately, he died, as well as three of his lab mates. So you know, I use that as a cautionary tale in my lab all the time. And just three years later, Alfred invented dynamite. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. But dynamite was a real revolution because it was stabilized. It was actually made of completely edible ingredients, nitroglycerin, which Alfred himself would take for angina, and, uh, and, and things like chalk and antacids and things like that. But when combined in just the right proportion, as many inventions uh, that you guys are familiar with, then you get, this secret, you get the secret sauce that really made Alfred one of the richest people in the world. Then in 1888, Alfred was walking around in Paris, uh, where he would soon be exiled for, for uh, siding with uh, the enemy of France, namely Italy, and building them war munitions. And he was walking down the street. He saw a headline, and the headline said, the merchant of death, Alfred Nobel, is dead. And it was like a celebratory obituary, if you can imagine that, very obstreperous. So he, he saw this headline, and he realized, hmm, you know, I'm very much alive. You know, the reports of my demise are a little bit exaggerated. But it was actually his older brother, Ludwig, the one who had received control of the business of Nobel and Sons from his father. So Alfred read that, and actually, it, he treated it as a great gift. 
because he realized that if he didn't change his ways, that the way the newspaper described him as the merchant of death, the person responsible for more deaths in human history than any other person, that would be the legacy that he would be remembered by. So he resolved then to change this, and he really, in my sense, he, he endowed the Nobel Prize a few years later in an attempt, I think, at public relations, and it was wildly successful. So if you go to uh, Google Patents or patents.google, you'll find uh, an invention list of 355 inventions. The most profitable was dynamite. Dynamite, Alfred Nobel, actually, he did some A-B testing on Google AdWords back then, and he was going to originally call it Nobel's safety powder. You know, it was like a euphemism because he wanted to, people knew that nitroglycerin was very, uh, you know, had this connotation of being deadly. In fact, when people at the drugstore would have to buy nitroglycerin in the 1800s, they wouldn't ask for it. They called it, they made up a name for it called trinitrin or something like that, and that was done to not scare the chemist or the pharmacist. So he made this uh, substance, later the, the A choice and the A-B testing dynamite one and it means power rock and there's some pictures of what it looked like and uh, this made him one of the wealthiest people in the world uh, at that time <clears throat> with that money he endowed this medallion this prize that bears his name he endowed, endowed five prizes in peace chemistry literature medicine or physiology and my field of physics and what was so interesting to me is to, as I'll show you later on in, the pro, in, in this talk, not only did I personally lose the Nobel Prize, but I was asked to nominate the winners of the Nobel Prize the very next year after I lost it, okay? It was kind of bittersweet. And, uh, and, it, and it actually led me to this uh, voyage of exploration and hopefully uh, reformation for, for humanity's superlative prize. So this prize was endowed by Alfred Nobel's will, and he wrote it down by hand. And, and the prize was, uh, was, 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 was so uh, important to him, he specified exactly what he wanted to happen and what would be uh, the, the ultimate aim of this prize. And I'll explain what he wanted as we go on. But the first thing I want to say is that um, this story involves, uh, if, you, if you will, the villain in my book is, uh, is this very humble substance called dust. And I have, uh, I'm blessed to have five children now. I'm very familiar with dust. Uh, but it's a different kind of dust. But, but it made me think back when, when you'll see the encounter that I'll describe scientifically in this book between dust and me and my experiment. It made me think of the biblical verse that goes ashes to ashes, dust to dust. So it means that humanity, humans start off their life basically as nothing but dust. And then we end, our ultimate aim of everybody is dust. And so poetically, I thought, well, that's kind of interesting because the history of astronomy also begins in some sense with dust. And stardust literally flows through our veins right now. The iron and the hemoglobin in your blood was once and the core of a supernova that exploded and repopulated the universe, the cosmos, in our local solar neighborhood with heavy elements. And those heavy elements eventually coalesced and made their way into your bloodstream. So dust is a villain in some sense in this book, as you'll find out. But we're not the only ones who have been bedeviled by dust devils in the cosmos. The first one was the first astronomer in history to use a telescope, Galileo Galilei. There's a sketch of his telescope. And he, of course, oh, there's a sketch of his telescope. He used this telescope to make discoveries that were impossible to make with the human eye unaided. And this telescope, this tiny little thing that you can get, uh, I'm not at a bookstore. Sometimes I'm at a bookstore. I'm forbidden to use a certain online retailer that starts with A. And, and uh, so, so I said, nowadays, you can buy a telescope online on Google Shopping.Google, right? Um, <laughs> And it costs less than some apps that you guys probably make, OK? So this is something that if you have a child in your life, even here in Los Angeles or the Bay Area or wherever, you can see the same exact sights that Galileo saw. And what did he see? Some of it is depicted here. That, those are his sketches, some of the first, what I call, stop motion uh, animation of what the moons of Jupiter were doing. So these are the orbits. This is a, a plot that he made in the early part of 1610 of what the planet Jupiter looked like through his telescope. Tiny little thing. And he saw that there were these stars, and he called these stars the Medici satellites. So he named the, the, the satellites after his patrons, after his benefactors, the Medici family of, of northern Italy. And you see also he made depictions of the planet Venus and saw that it had this strange behavior where it would change its phase, its shape. It would look like a miniature moon with a crescent and then a gibbous phase. And, the moon, and Saturn appeared as if it had these weird pitcher-like ears on it. And then you see the, the sketches of the moon on the, uh, on the upper right as well. So what Galileo did was so titanic because he overthrew the paradigm that the Earth was the sole center of the universe. So back then, they considered the solar system to be the entire universe. And the Earth was the center of the solar system. So therefore, the Earth was the center of the, of the, of the entire universe. 
What they didn't know until Galileo used the telescope was that there were other centers of the solar system. So it could not be unique that the Earth is the center of the solar system if there's another center, namely the planet Jupiter. So Galileo didn't, as, as people uh, often uh, misconstrue what Galileo did, he didn't prove the Copernican hypothesis. He didn't prove that the sun is the center of the, uh, uh, of the uh, universe. He just disproved that the Earth is the only center of the universe. So that was an important, you know, if overly belabored, I'm an academician, okay? So forgive me. But I claim, you know, as brilliant as he was, he made some blunders. And he made many blunders, and they were done in a service to further confirm the Copernican hypothesis. He went to his grave, as you, as you may know, uh, for basically committing the crime of heresy, suggesting that the Earth was not the center of the universe. And in part of that, he never really recanted this decision that he believed so strongly and that he was uh, basically unwilling to part with. But not only that, he used every piece of evidence that he had in physics and in uh, astronomy to try to bolster his argument. And it's a phenomenon known as confirmation bias. And we, as, as human beings, and scientists, as you guys know, are also human beings, despite the stereotypes, to the contrary. But this little asterism, does anyone know what this asterism is? Maybe some of you drive one of these asterisms. This is Subaru in Japanese. It means the seven sisters of Pleiades. The Pleiades in Greek literature were the uh, nurses of Dionysus, who is the god of the grape. So he's responsible for all our wine. Uh, and they were his nurses. I don't know how they got that these little stars are like that. In fact, you can only see six of them with uh, even good eyes. Uh, but Galileo went even further with this. He looked at the constellation, this little asterism, and he sketched it as it appeared to his eye. And Edward Tuft, the famous uh, uh, kind of sociologist of science or, or, or a raconteur of science, he calls Galileo the world's first data scientist. So I'm sure there's a lot of da data scientists here. So if you see here, Galileo's depicting the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, in an interesting, unique fashion. He's showing two different types of stars. There are open stars, like stars of David with six points on them. And then there's filled in, completely closed in stars. And they're totally different. And I want you to think for a second what those could possibly mean. I actually gave this talk to a bunch of astronomers at Caltech a couple of days ago, and they couldn't understand. Or almost none of them guessed what it meant. But I'll, I'll give you a second to think about it, and then uh, we can also read what Galileo wrote beneath it. He said, what we observed is the nature of the matter of Milky Way itself, which with the aid of the spyglass, which is what he called the telescope, is observed so well that, it, that <clears throat> all the disciplines that for so many generations have vexed philosophers can be destroyed by visible certainty. And we are liberated from their wordy arguments. Okay, so back then, physicists weren't great fans of philosophers. Even nowadays, that's, <laughs> that's also held to be true. But if, you're, if, you're, if you haven't come up with the answer to what do these different types of iconography, what do they represent, the stars that are open, these six-pointed stars of Dave, those represent stars that the human eye can see unaided. The stars that are black and filled in are those that he can only see with the telescope. And he said that the entire constellation, or the entire asterism, it's technically not called a constellation, but it's a little collection of stars, that the entire star collection, which is shown here through the Hubble telescope, that this can be, could be resolved into stars, even the glowing gaseous nebulosity, what we call nebulosity now. When in fact, now we know uh, that even with a much more powerful telescope, even the Hubble telescope, 50 times bigger in diameter, uh, than, than Galileo's, that you still can't resolve the nebulosity into stars. And so what was it? He was trying to say that the nature of the Milky Way was purely made of stars. So first he demoted the, the Earth from the center of the solar system. Then he said the sun could be the center of the solar system. And then he said the sun is just like any other star in the Milky Way. So it's quite interesting. Everything that he's using is done in a furtherance of the Copernican hypothesis. So it's a confirmation bias example par excellence. He later went on to conjecture that the tides that we feel here on Earth are caused by the rotation of the Earth on its axis and also the revolution of the Earth around the sun. We now know that to be completely incorrect. The tides that we feel, high tide and low tide here near the beach, are caused by the moon's gravitational influence. But why did he want to, why did he want to say it was from the, the Earth's motion around the sun? Because that meant that the Earth went around the sun. And that's completely wrong. So even the greatest intellectual physicist in history, Galileo, uh, to some of us, made blunders. And they were done because of what he wanted to see. And that's a theme that runs throughout cosmology to this very day, and sad to report, affected us on my project called BICEP that I'll talk about. So Galileo made this blunder. OK, it's not the worst blunder you can make you know, with the first telescope in human history. Uh, but you see here, one other thing to notice is that this is a nebulosity. This nebulosity is not stars. It's actually made of gas. It's made of dust. 
and it's made of particles that act like little mirrors, and some of them are metallic as well. So we actually know that they twinkle, in a sense, because of the reflection of the starlight off of tiny mirrors of dust. So Galileo was deceived by dust into thinking that the sun was just a star like any other star in the vast assemblage of stars we call the Milky Way galaxy. So not all that twinkles is a diamond. So that'll be a theme throughout. So again, the Copernican model, which wasn't proven, so by the standards of mathematical proof, in science what we do is really disprove other uh, hypotheses. So what Galileo technically did is disprove the Ptolemaic, Aristotelian, ancient Greek conception of the cent central position of the Earth about the cosmos. And you see the more complicated version of Copernicus and Galileo on, on the right. So what we're trying to do now, and what I describe in my book, is since the time of Galileo, there have been four other Copernican revolutions. There have been revolutions after Galileo disabused humanity of its central purpose and central point in the universe's arrangement. The next group of astronomers promptly forgot that lesson. The, the best astronomer, one of the best astronomers of 1700s named William Herschel, he made a map of the Milky Way galaxy, and guess where he put the Earth and the Sun? At the center of the Milky Way galaxy, where it's actually technically not located there. The next uh, couple of what are called great debates in my book, they were corresponding to, is the Milky Way galaxy the center of the universe? And was our galaxy central not only in space, but in time? Is there something special about humanities, galaxy, et cetera, in time and space? And then the question is, is our universe the only universe? Or is what's called the multiverse centered on us as well? That's the last of the five debates in my book. But I say there's many more of these debates to come where humanity overemphasizes its importance and nature conspires like the ultimate big brother to say, you're not that great. And that's what happens. Okay, I've got a big brother and I've got uh, three sons and I'm also a big brother. So. I can say that. So I want to show you guys something kind of cool, because this took place just up the road from you guys, and it has a, ni a nice, really cool Google connection. So in the 1960s, this was the original internet. Okay, So they launched a balloon somewhere over central Kansas. And from JPL, just up the road in Pasadena, they shot radio waves that bounced off this giant metallic reflective mylar co covered balloon. And they bounced those signals, or they tried to bounce those signals, to a receiving horn in Holmdel, New Jersey. So it's transcontinental communication with radio waves. And so what this reminds me of nowadays is what you guys do here, uh, or do elsewhere within the, within the corporation, is get internet, okay? Except this internet says your motto is balloon-powered internet for everyone. So that was balloon-powered internet for one communicator at a time. <laughs> so if they were, you know, if, you, if, if someone was on the phone or using the internet, it was much worse than dial-up even. But they found they couldn't get it to work because the balloon signal decreases uh, as sort of like the fourth power of the distance they were trying to transmit. So instead, they launched a tiny little satellite into space, and it was called Telstar. Now, you guys, m by the looks of it, are way too young to remember when the first communication satellites were launched. But actually, Sputnik, the very first satellite ever launched in the late 1950s, was basically a radio transmitter. And that solved a lot of the problems of the inverse square law, which kills the power transmitted and kills the power received. And so they launched a satellite into space. And these astronomers, Penzias and Wilson, using that same horn antenna used with the reflective balloon, they were using this to see if they could see the signal to noise that they needed to do real internet communications using a transceiver, a device that could receive uh, signals from California and then amplify them, boost them, and send them down. This worked fantastically well, except when they kept looking at the satellite through their telescope, they didn't get the signal to noise they predicted. And they were very diligent scientists, and they tracked down all the sources of error they could find, including the fact that there was a, there was a nest of pigeons inside of this antenna that would not go away. In fact, Penzias over here, he took them in his car and drove them from northern New Jersey to Philadelphia. And guess what? These are homing pigeons. So what do they do? They came back. And they described it, these pigeons as leaving a white dielectric material inside the horn. <laughs> that they couldn't get rid of it. They scrubbed it, they cleaned it. Finally, they couldn't get rid of it. So they went to, to um, you know, their quartermaster or whatever, and they said, we need a shotgun. <laughs> and they said, why? They said, we got to kill these birds. And they did. And our, uh, Penzias later recounted, he said, the birds left with a little bang, and then we discovered the big bang. And that's really what happened next. So they ended up making a map of the sky that they could not remove a c persistent three degree Kelvin above absolute zero glow coming in all directions, which if you had microwave vision to your eyes without the aid of boosting contrast, this is what you'd see. If you could see microwaves, you'd go out and look around. Everything surrounding the Earth would be colored in a certain sense. 
constant, persistent, never changing with season or direction or anything. It's a background that comes from the Big Bang because they were looking back not only in space, but they were looking back in time. Nowadays, we can subtract the average signal, this three Kelvin signal, and some of my colleagues at, at, uh, at NASA made an, a beautiful animation of what this picture would look like if you had very high contrast in addition to high sensitivity. You would see tiny ripples, tiny fluctuations in this pattern. So if you zoom in on this image after boosting up its contrast, you see that it has fluctuations in temperature. The temperature is not exactly 3 Kelvin. In some places, it's 3 Kelvin plus 10 micro Kelvin, 10 millionths of a Kelvin. In some other places, it's 10, 3 Kelvin minus 10 micro Kelvin. That's about the size of how much it varies from point to point on the sky. And thank goodness it does vary, because without those variations, the matter that makes up the stars and galaxies in our universe wouldn't know where to coagulate. In a uniform uni universe, and, and it was known that this was true from the time of Laplace and Newton, that the, a uniformly distributed universe with uniform matter throughout would never provide a nucleation site for matter to uh, agglomerate to create the stars, planets, and galaxies that we see today. So that's a nice uh, image there. The question is, what caused those fluctuations in the beginning? You could imagine that you could explain something if it was perfectly smooth, and you could explain something that is wildly not smooth, but it's very hard to get fine-tuned amounts of fluctuation. So 10 microkelvin out of, say, let's just call it 10 Kelvin, that's a few parts per million. It's fine-tuning. Where does that smoothness come from that's smooth but not perfectly smooth? It's actually smoother than the surface of a bowling ball. Any bowling ball is smoother than my bowling ball because I'm a terrible bowler and I make big dents in it. But the surface of a bowling ball, compared to its, its radius instantaneously, compared to its average radius, varies by about 10 times that amount. The universe is much smoother than anything, than any other you know, naturally occurring thing that you might be familiar with. So we set out to try to understand where do those fluctuations come from, and we built a telescope called BICEP to do it. The theory underpinning why there should be fluctuations, the, the leading candidate theory is called inflation. Inflation predicts that in the extremely early universe, a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth after the Big Bang, that the universe underwent this strange kind of phase transition that was quantum in nature. And the amount of expansion varied from point to point in space because quantum fields do that. They're uh, rare, random variables, and they'll have fluctuations in them that technically are called Gaussian random fluctuations. And that could lead to enough fine tuning that you could get a universe that's smooth, but not perfectly smooth. And again, without the, without the uh, deviation from perfect smoothness, we would not be here. There'd be no way for galaxy to know where to form, if you like. So we were, we were interested in trying to measure this extremely early fraction of a, of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. This is called inflation. It's very hard to depict something that nobody knows anything really about. And so you know, sometimes it's just shown as a giant question mark. I don't think that's too useful. This uh, is meant to illustrate that the universe had these quantum fluctuations throughout it. And they would lead to variations which would later cause these temperature patterns to originate. And that's exactly the leading candidate of the early cosmogenic theory of, of the universe. So I like to compare this to another form of evolution. So if there are some you know, biology uh, uh, aficionados in the audience, you may recognize this object. This is called a blastocyst. It's a collection of human cells about 1,000 seconds after your parents had their own personal Big Bang. <laughs> this object has about 100 or so cells, and it will later evolve into somebody. But what we're trying to do is take an image of somebody today, or the universe as it looks to us today, and then extrapolate back in time to what the universe was like 50 orders of magnitude earlier in time. Here's what you look like at 1,000 seconds. And imagine trying to understand what the, would this blastocyst, this embryo, become? What would it look like? Who has a guess? Anyone have a guess? Eric Schmidt? No, nobody like that? OK, so I'll give you a hint. I'm going to give you a hint here. I'm going to put some identifying features on the blastocyst. And then, of course, we recognize it <laughs> as my children's favorite astrophysicist. You don't know how bad that feels, OK? <laughs> <laughs> they don't care about daddy, they, they care about Neil. Uh, so here's how he looks at an age of about uh, being generous, two billion seconds. You want to feel old? Quote your age in seconds. That's about 50, 59 years, I think he is. Um, and if you want to extrapolate back to what he was as a blastocyst, that's a factor of two million. We're trying to go 50 orders of magnitude, not six orders of magnitude, 50 orders of magnitude. We thought we could do it using a very special type of telescope because the teles if the telescope were sensitive to what's called the light's polarization, then the reverberations of space-time produced during inflation would produce this crazy twisting curl mode pattern on the microwave sky. 
So in addition to the temperature fluctuations, there'd be variations in polarization. So we have Polaroids. You guys living in Southern California have to have these. They're de rigueur. These are my state university funded uh, sunglasses that I get to wear. These uh, are sensitive to one orientation of the light's polarization. And as you rotate one versus the other one, you go from light to dark to light to dark. So it rotates twice in amplitude for every single physical rotation of these Polaroids. We did the same thing, not with optical light, but with microwaves. And what we did is we claimed that there was evidence for what are called gravitational waves produced during the Big Bang's inflationary epoch that shook up space-time so violently that it caused these patterns to originate. And that was what we claim we discovered. I'm going to talk to you about that. We used this instrument here, called it BICEP. I coined the term. Uh, it's, uh, it stands for Background Imager of Cosmic Extragalactic Polarization. But it was really called that because the pattern that we're looking for are these swirling, curling, twisting patterns. And I thought it was kind of cute that the bicep, you know, you guys go down to the gym here, you work on the bicep, that's the muscle that powers you to do curls. And I thought, well, that's kind of a cute name for this. It's actually a Galilean spyglass. It's just a microwave spyglass. So I brought some of our detectors here and here and what they look like, but they're sensitive to wavelengths of light of about two millimeters. Instead of 500 microns, like your eye is sensitive to, these are sensitive to much, much longer wavelengths where the microwave signal gets the brightest, where we observe these photons from the Big Bang. The lenses are made of ordinary milk jug-like material. Let me go back just like you'd find in a milk jug. And you know that a milk jug can actually transmit light through it or heat through it because you've picked up a milk jug at the supermarket and you feel it's cold. Even though you can't see through these lenses with your eye, they transmit microwaves perfectly and they actually bend and refract microwaves. Instead of landing on Galileo's uh, retina, they land on these, uh, these superconducting sensors that were built up at JPL. And they're over here, an example of those. So these sensors transduce the microwave heat into electrical resistance, and then we're able to measure that on a superconductor very, very accurately. Instead of having a, you know, uh, a 10 megapixels like the, uh, what's the current droid model? Uh, so we only had about 256 pixels, so we had less than a milli megapixel. Uh, so it's not that powerful, but don't take your droid and do what we did to it, namely cool it down to 454 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, because it won't we'll avoid the warranty, I'm sure about that. And I don't know what kind of plant replacement plant on. So we ended up putting this telescope, instead of in Galileo's hands, we put it in a mount that we tested here in Caltech, and then we shipped it down to the very bottom of the world. So this is a telescope that's very much human-sized, except in addition, instead of looking through visible light like Galileo did, it looked through microwave in a microwave regime of the electromagnetic spectrum. Then we digitized the resistance that these detectors see as they scan the sky and rotated the polarization. Then we use supercomputers at Harvard and elsewhere to, to uh, process these you know, many, many gigabytes of data collected over three years. The telescope had to be brought somewhere very nice. I would have liked to have brought it, you know, kept it at the, you know, in San Diego or Caltech. We ended up taking it to the South Pole because the South Pole is, the, uh, is one of the highest and driest continents on Earth, the, the Antarctica is. And dryness is important, as you know, when you go to the commissary here, whatever cafeteria here. Um, I don't know how you guys all stay in shape, by the way. But when you go there, you heat up water in the microwave. The cup, if it's ceramic, will not get hot. You can touch the cup right after boiling the water. Water absorbs microwaves, and it does so very efficiently. That means water molecules in the Earth's atmosphere will also absorb microwaves. We don't want that happening. These photons have been traveling for 13.82 billion years. We don't want them to get absorbed in a water molecule floating above our observatory. So people say, well, why don't you put it in space? And I say, why don't you give me a billion dollars? And I'll be happy to do that, because that's how much it costs. It costs 100 times more money to build a, a, an equivalent satellite object in space if you get permission from NASA to do the launch or, or whoever. So, so the early explorers in, the 19, uh, in 1911, 1912, made it to the South Pole for the first time. No one had ever seen it. People didn't even know about the existence of the continent of Antarctica until the mid 1800s, say. And the, but at that point, they only saw about half of 1% of it. They knew nothing about this continent, which is much, much bigger than, than the um, than central United States. So this is the second team that ever reached the South Pole. This is a team led by Robert Falcon Scott. And he got to the South Pole uh, uh, carrying scientific equipment, 
meteorites that he had collected along the way, parts of dead sea lions that he had found along the way. He was a scientist. He was doing an expedition. He refused to use dogs because all the dogs that had ever been to Antarctica, they're actually banned now to bring dogs to Antarctica or any animals besides grad students. Just kidding, grad students out there. Um, you're, you're actually forbidden to bring any animals down there because you always end up eating them, and they, they would. In fact, the, the Swedish team, the Norwegian team that beat them there, led by Roald Amundsen, got to the South Pole in three weeks or so, ate the dogs, had a big feast at the South Pole, put a flag in the, in the snow, and went back home, down 10,000 feet of ice and 700 miles north. Of course, everywhere is north from there. This is the second team, and when Scott got there, he said, great God, this is an awful place. <laughs> and you know, I kind of felt uh, exactly the opposite. I felt this is a totally awesome place, except it's not all fun and games, as it was back then um, for Scott. Oh, no, he died, but, but, um, <laughs> but we live. But it's a very dangerous place to go, as this video I captured last time shows. Okay? You think it's really cute, but no, the penguins do not try them. Although I say, you know, I have a lot of friends I go out to dinner with. They say, you know, I can't decide between chicken and fish. I say, have a penguin. It's like the best. Nowadays, it's an awesome place when you're down there. The US taxpayers, you here and you out there and, and, and on, on, on YouTube, uh, fund this wonderful station, about $150 million station built over the last uh, 15 or so years. We get you know, uh, our private room and things that Scott could never possibly imagine. Here's the axis on which the Earth was spinning when I was there the last time. Uh, in 2008, 2009, the Earth is spinning about this axis, and you know, straight down through here is the North Pole. So it's amazing. So I can actually run around the world. I'm not in good shape, but I can run around the world in 10 seconds. I think it's pretty cool. There you go. There you have to check in on you know Google Plus, right? So I took a picture, send it to Google Plus, uh, and there's the building in which we put that instrument, that beautiful telescope that we spent about uh, five years building, and it's called uh, the observatory down here. And then I always say the observatory is the second most important building at the South Pole, OK? Because you got you to gotta take care of business. But you notice the building is built up on stilts. And this might interest any of you who are on the east, from the East Coast, as I am originally. On the East Coast, they build houses on the beach up on stilts because they don't want sand to cover them up or decay the foundation. Here, snow is the enemy. Snow would eventually uh, over, overflow over the entire building within a, only about a decade or so. So they, they build it up on, on stilts. The snow can blow and pass right through. So the outhouse has been buried over, and we're working hard to get my grad student. No, 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 the grad student's fine. Uh, but it is, uh, they paint it black to keep it nice and warm, and, uh, but it cannot be built up on stilts. If, if I do, as I say often, that would be truly worthy of a Nobel Prize, uh, a, a second story outhouse, OK? Don't, don't use them until, until I've tested them for you. <laughs> so of course, what do we have at the South Pole? We have Street View. I love this image down here. This is what, <laughs> this is what uh, Google thinks. <laughs> you know, if you get driving directions to the South Pole, uh, you get them from Google. This is what Street View shows. So go visit Street View. You can actually pan around. And this is what, uh, this is what the Bicep 2 Observatory looks like. It's pretty cute. We made a huge announcement on St. Patrick's Day 2014. We said we detected this twisting roiling, boiling surface of last scattering that was in, infused, we said, with gravitational wave energy. And those gravitational waves, we claimed, could only have come from inflation. So we made this huge announcement. It got a lot of attention. Uh, there was a huge media you know, storm about it. There was a viral YouTube video, which got millions of views. You know, This is a scientific discovery about a very arcane, abstract topic, like inflationary universe cosmology, gravitational waves, microwave astronomy. And yet within minutes, millions of people had seen this video. This is one of the founders of the theory of inflation and his wife and their professors at Stanford, along with one of my colleagues, Chao Lin Kuo, who's a professor at Stanford. There was a news conference at Harvard, and there was newspaper coverage all over the world. The paper, newspaper of record covered it, the San Diego Union Tribune I'm speaking about. Um, so that was here. They put the exact number of seconds after the Big Bang that we claimed to make the discovery. <clears throat> and I, oh, I love this headline over here. Hold on. I'll get to the onion in a second. I like this headline in The Economist, because it sounds like just some dude was watching, and all of a sudden he saw the <laughs> beginning of the universe. Holy cow. But, for true hilarity, we have to go to The Onion. So within days of our discovery, The Onion comes out with this headline, top theoretical physicists and R&B singers meet to debate the meaning of forever. And you see down here, we can observe long-term phenomena like the cosmic background radiation, primordial B-mode polarization, and the love between India Ari and her man, all of which seem to have existed since the universe's infancy. And the subcaption says, you, uh, the participants debate if it's theoretically possible to give you my heart forever. <laughs> So I'll leave it to the onion, right? 
Uh, alas, our Nobel dreams were not uh, to last very long. Uh, it turned out that we made a discovery, and a very consistent discovery, and that discovery turned out to be this very mercurial substance called dust that I began the talk with. So it turns out that there's dust in the interstellar medium that comes from, fail whoops, that comes from failed stars, stars that have exploded in so-called supernovae. And these dust grains can sometimes be made of iron, such as the iron in our blood. That's exactly where it came from. There wasn't some iron factory you know, that made the uh, hemoglobin molecules. These little grains of dust can become magnetized if they're made of iron, and then they become like little compass needles. And it turns out the Milky Way galaxy also has a magnetic field in it, and a compass in a magnetic field will orient towards the magnetic field lines. And in such a case, it can actually orient to produce the exact swirling, twisting, curling pattern that BICEP was designed to measure. And in fact, that became the most likely culprit for the signal that we saw. We didn't make a blunder. We didn't leave the lens cap on. But what we thought we were seeing is back to the very beginning of time, we thought we were searching from Earth here in the South Pole, looking past all the planets, galaxies, Pleiades, everything, even back to the beginning of time, the Big Bang, the first few uh, trillionths of a second after the Big Bang. But instead, what we were seeing was more like dust between us and our galaxy and the surface. And it exactly acted as an, as an imposter signal, mimicking the signal we tried to confirm. Again, this is a very pernicious phenomenon, a very common one in science, confirmation bias. Because we were told in part that we would get this, uh, this beautiful medallion I'll show you in a second. Um, uh, I do want to take away, because sometimes I've said, I've given talks where people ask me afterwards, like, you got to lay off the dust, man. Okay, this is, like, you're being too harsh on dust. Dust is great, and I want to say that I am very appreciative of dust. Not only does dust flow through our, stardust flow through our veins, but also, as Carl Sagan poetically put it, he turned, he had the NASA uh, engineers turn the Voyager satellite around after it passed through doing the outer planets in our solar system. And it took an image, a selfie of the Earth from millions of miles past, past the orbit of Saturn. And he says here, this image here, and you can see a tiny little dot. He says, you look at that, you see a dot. He says, that's here, that's home, that's us. Every saint and sinner in life history of our species lived, lived there on a mode of dust suspended in a sunbeam. This is a camera artifact, the sunbeam here, but it's so poetic. And it is true, the, the Earth is a giant ball of dust that coagulated over eons to form a solid surface that we can stand on. Again, thank goodness, or else we wouldn't be here to have this conversation. Dust creates, it creates life, it creates planets, but it also can destroy. It destroys Nobel Prizes. And so uh, to add insults to injury, not long after we had the discovery retracted, not after we went through this embarrassing, painful process of having to retract the, the claims that we made, I, I note that we always, have, we always see front page headlines and press conferences, but you never see front page headline retraction of previous front page headline or, or press conference. We have to tell you we were wrong. Uh, so it seems like the media are in part to blame for stoking the attitude within scientists that, it, that the press conferences and newspapers, and I'm as guilty as, as anyone of this, but uh, there's an immense pressure in academia to, to produce these Everything has to be an outstanding breakthrough, and very uh, rarely does that actually take place. And part of the book is written in such a way as to give hope to people that most people don't win the Nobel Prize. Most people don't win the Oscars. Most people don't win their high school class presidency, right? So how do you deal with failure, embarrassment, humiliation even, and get back up, dust yourself off, and get back to work? So to add insult to injury, though, for me, I came into work in October of 2015, and I found this document that said to dear Professor Brian Keating, we have the honor to ask you to nominate the winners of the next Nobel Prize, <laughs> okay? So, you know, it's like you got fired, but can you give a recommendation to the, the person that should take your job and interview, uh, interview her? So this was a letter that was marked strictly confidential, so don't tell anybody, okay? Nobody out there tell anybody. But it was, <laughs> it was asking me to nominate the winners of the Nobel Prize in physics. And, uh, and it, was, uh, it was part of a small set of people that are chosen randomly, but not so randomly as, as I might get a chance to describe in Q&A, but uh, of, of who should win the Nobel Prize each year. And this actually set me on a very interesting quest that became the second meaning of the double entendre of the book's title. So the first meaning is how I lost the Nobel Prize due to thanks to dust, or no thanks to dust. And the second meaning is what I learned about the Nobel Prize that shocked me and in the process of nominating winners uh, for the 2016 prize. So I'm an academic, right? So what do we do as academicians? We go back and look at primary reference material. 
So I went back to Alfred Nobel's will. And I'm fluent in Swedish, as we all are now. No. So I, I couldn't read it. But thankfully, it's translated online. You can find it. And what I found in his will was really surprising. And what it's led to in the preceding 120 years since he wrote down the will and 116 years of Nobel Prizes is quite surprising. So what he said was, in his will, he said, the whole of my estate should be given and divided in the following way. A portion of it should be given to the person or the persons, the person during the preceding year who has conferred the greatest benefit to mankind. And it says later, one part to the person, not in the, in, the, in the plural, in the singular. So Nobel Prizes should be given for discoveries or inventions that had the greatest benefit to mankind in the preceding year. And I started to think, hmm, how many astrophysics discoveries have benefited all of mankind and done so in a year? And it started to make me think, of like, what were the original intents of the Nobel Prize? And how did those early Nobel Prizes get carried out? And how have we overlooked great discoveries uh, or, or not? So I'm going to show you here. I'm going to give a quiz, which I, which I gave at Facebook. And they all got it right. So I want to ask you guys, see how you guys did it, OK? So um, am I allowed to say Facebook? OK, so I wanted to ask you guys. There's three choices here, A, B, and C. So raise your hand if you think the RNA molecule won the Nobel Prize. These are all eligible for the Nobel Prize. They're all invented after Alfred Nobel's death. Anybody think that the uh, RNA molecule, the most important precursor building block of human life and other life? Nobody? Oh, OK, a couple people, good. The periodic table, choice B. Raise your hand if you think periodic table. I remind you, there's an element on there called nobelium, OK? Invented by uh, Mendeleev. OK, there's like one or two of you guys, good, good. And then choice C uh, appears to be like a, a lighthouse. Anybody think the lighthouse could? The lighthouse, really? You guys think the light, God, the guys at Facebook got it. No, of course it's the lighthouse. <laughs> of course. It was given to Gustave Delenn in 1912 for his invention of automatic regulators for use in automatic automators, and lighthouses, and buoys. Unbelievable. It benefits our life every day, doesn't it? I mean, I was just, I had to come up here from San Diego, and I thank God I had those gas accumulators guiding me <laughs> along the way. So, okay, so maybe that was just an early blunder, but actually it's typical. It's actually what Alfred Nobel wanted. He was an inventor, right? He had Google patents galore. And he wanted to reward things. And this did benefit people back in, you know, people were crashing into rocks in Sweden, and he didn't want that. So this was very typical actually of what he wanted. And it's morphed so significantly, you know, to, to say in 2013 when the discovery of the Higgs boson, actually the prediction of the Higgs boson, was rewarded. And I asked people, like, how often throughout the day do you say, oh, thank God for the Higgs boson? And like, <laughs> at least the lighthouse get, you know, did something practical. And of course, there's been other controversies with the Nobel Prize. There's some, uh, some examples. I'm not commenting on any of them. But just these are controversies that have been aroused. And, and some of the winners have been a little bit unsavory. This is one of the most egregious examples, William Shockley, who won the Nobel Prize for the invention of the technology that you guys would not have jobs without, namely the transistor. He got the Nobel Prize. And yet he said terrible things about eugenics and ideas for sterilization of African Americans. And he thought that was a way to increase the IQ of the world. And he was one of these, uh, actually, he was studied in this famous study called Terman's Termites, a study of future Nobel Prize winners, brilliant men in society. And they wanted to see, is there a correlation between IQ and the Nobel Prize? And he was one of the counterexamples because his IQ was below average, or, or about average, and, and, so, and yet he did win the Nobel Prize. There was a famous book written about him, so he was very generous, uh, not with his money, uh, putting his money, he kept his money in the bank, but he also kept other things in the bank. He was one of the first donors to the famous Nobel Prize sperm bank, which is located in lovely San Diego County. So you can come visit it. No, no, it's not in existence anymore. It went, it went bankrupt, I guess. Nobody made any withdrawals that we know about. But this is all done in a social engineering eugenics thing that you would be put in jail to do nowadays. So, uh, so that was you know, another controversial example. I'll hit other ones later. But keep in mind the criterion the criteria that Alfred Nobel stipulated. A single person in the preceding year conferred the greatest benefit on mankind for all the prizes, chemistry, physics, physiology. The Nobel Prize in economics was added uh, 60 years after the first Nobel Prizes. So it wasn't part of Alfred Nobel's will. And it's actually no longer called the Nobel Prize in economics. Someone says, I won the Nobel Prize in math. You know they're lying because there's no such thing as a Nobel Prize in math. And uh, if they also say, I won, the, I'm a Nobel, uh, I won the Nobel Prize in economics, it's actually called a much catchier name now. It's called the Swedish Central Bank Prize in honor of the memory of Alfred Nobel. <laughs> so put that on a t-shirt here. You know. So last year, the Nobel Prize was given to the discovery of gravitational waves from the uh, orbit of two black holes that came crashing together about 1.3 billion light years away from Earth. These signals traveled throughout 
the universe or throughout, from galaxy to our galaxy and were detected in September of 2015. And I want to take us through this example because what actually ended up happening when the detection was made in September 2015, it was a billion years after, more than a billion years after the discovery of the, the actual event. What happened between then and, and, and detection, between the production of the black hole a signal when these black holes crashed together and the eventual Nobel Prize award is actually illustrative of one of the biggest problems I have with the Nobel Prize, that it can't be given away posthumously. These uh, black holes were announced, the detection of these black holes were announced about 11 days after the deadline for my nomination in 2016. So the, the January deadline passed, uh, and you have to have your nominations in by the 31st of January every year, or else they'll just throw them away, and they don't save them for the next year. The LIGO announcement was not made in a famous press conference in DC until the 11th of February. So they missed that deadline. That means I could not nominate them. I nominated somebody else. And I, and I can invite you to guess who it was. I, I trust you will not be able to guess who it is, but I don't mention who I, who I nominated. But I didn't get to nominate these people because they never made the announcement in time for me to make the uh, nomination. So they would have to wait till the next year. And all was fine, except for the fact that one of the three founding fathers of LIGO, Ronald Drever, died on March 7, 2017. That meant when LIGO actually was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2017, he was left out, and another person, Barry Barish, up at Caltech, took his place. And even Barish said if they had given the prize away a year earlier, I would not have won it. Because the Nobel Prize can nowadays be won by up to three people, another rules change that they've made. So what does this illustrate? This means that if these black holes had crashed together 11 days earlier, and everything else in the history of the universe proceeded at the same way, and there's no reason maybe to think not, that this man would have a Nobel Prize. And in fact, uh, and then the other man, uh, Barry Barish, would not. So it's so capricious because of this rule that they made up themselves in 1974, no posthumous Nobel Prizes. And they actually have given it away three times to three men. And I'll be talking about uh, sexism in the prize in just a second. But uh, they give it away to three men, and two of the three were Swedish men. Okay, so uh, so some people say there's there's lots of forms of bias with the Nobel Prize. So uh, uh, you know, so poor Ron Drever's memory and his family don't have this accolade to really look back on. Now this is going to become a big problem. This 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 plat here, I've been told you guys are very quantitative and you eat up data. Um, like I'm going to eat up lunch in a little bit. Uh, this shows the long time scales between the discovery of a Nobel-worthy invention or, or discovery and the award for several different branches of science. Fixating on physics, these blue curves here, it shows that from the 1900s up to 2000, it's now getting up to about 30 years plus between discovery of an effect and the Nobel Prize that's awarded for that discovery. And what's not increasing, and then I made a plot in my book where I took data from the Nobel Prize website on the age of different people when they won the Nobel Prize in each decade, and I came up with this plot here. I say this plot here. And it shows that the, in the early Nobel Prize, the average age was in the, you know, say, 50s. Then it went down to 40 almost. And now it's been rising faster than a couple of years per decade. <laughs> And they're eventually going to hit this deadline, right? <laughs> so there's not, there's not too much. I mean, maybe you guys can help with this. But eventually, the average age of the Nobel laureates this past year was 78 years old. The three men average age is 78. So this is going to become very serious, where the posthumous prize is always going to be given away. Unless you guys, and this could actually happen, I, I predict in a few years, it could be that artificial intelligence wins Nobel prizes. Why not? This thing it says, you know, it says the person. Well, they already gave up the. And so why can't they give up the person <laughs> as well? So I want to just point out a couple of technicalities. And this is who gets to nominate the winners of the Nobel Prize. I don't, you don't need to read it. It's mostly Swedish, Nor Nordic people. And then down here, there's people like me, people that the Academy sees fit to ask to nominate. So that was my category, number six in the pecking order. But notice number three in the pecking order are Nobel laureates in physics. So if you win a Nobel Prize, you're automatically entitled for the rest of your life to nominate winners of the Nobel Prize. And that has important ramifications. It turns out you're five times more likely to win a Nobel Prize if your PhD advisor was a Nobel laureate or your postdoctoral advisor was a Nobel laureate. And that's part of this, this, this phenomenon. So, uh, and that means it's harder to break into that phenomenon. Like if you're, if you're from a different group than has traditionally been awarded the Nobel Prize, to break into that, whether women or minorities, it becomes harder and harder for them to also get into this track where they can, the rich can get richer, so to speak. And they gave me the last piece of helpful advice they gave me. No one can nominate him or herself. So that was helpful. It narrowed it down by one person. Um, so I wasn't allowed to do that. 
I want to talk briefly about this clause. This is actually the opening statement of the Nobel Prize endowing will. It says, I, Alfred Nobel, do hereby, after mature deliberation, declare my following to my last will and testament. To my nephew, Jamar, I don't know how to pronounce that, and Ludwig, I bequeath the sum of 200,000 Swedish crowns. To my niece, Mina, I give 100,000 crowns. So the men got twice as much as the women. <laughs> Some people joke that this is the root of the Nobel Prize's sexism. I, I think it actually runs deeper than that. Nobody knows why he gave the, women, uh, the woman half as much as the men. But speaking of you know, half as much or two uh, entities, these are all the women who have won the Nobel Prize in physics. The first one, Marie Curie, won it in the early 1900s, and she was almost denied it. In fact, they weren't going to give it to her until her husband and co-laureate said, I'm not going to accept my prize for radioactivity unless you give it also to my wife because she did most of the work. So they ended up giving it to her, but it was grudgingly. And then Maria Gephardt Mayer, who was at UC San Diego, where I am, she won the last Nobel Prize in physics in 1963, 54 years ago, was the last woman to win the Nobel Prize. And, and in physics. And when she won it, she was only uh, able to win it after being nominated 27 times, which is twice as many times as Albert Einstein had to be nominated to win it. Why is that such a big deal? Albert Einstein was forbidden almost by the rules of the, uh, and regulations of the early part of the 1900s because Jews weren't allowed to win it. And in fact, because previous winners were allowed to nominate future winners, and they were the part of the committee that decided who wins the Nobel Prize, they were including Hitler's chief of Aryan physics, a man by the name of Philip Lennard, who had won the, 19, uh, the 1905 Nobel Prize. He had a mandate that Einstein could not win the Nobel Prize because he practiced theoretical physics, which was a form of world-bluffing Jewish physics. So, Einstein was forbidden, but only for 15 years. Women have not won it in 50, you know, first it was, they didn't win it, and then she had to be nominated 27 times before she actually won it. So it's just remarkable. And when she won it in our hometown paper in San Diego, the paper of record throughout the world, the San Diego Union Tribune, the headline read, San Diego housewife wins Nobel Prize. <laughs> that was the headline in October 1963. Just incredible. Here's a graph that shows women, a uh, fraction of women. You know, so there's only been two women that won it. So I always joke, you know, that means that there's only two more female Nobel Prize winners in physics than there have been female popes. Okay, female popes, people. Okay, all right. Um, so again, why could this be? Well, one reason is this clause that previous Nobel laureates can nominate future Nobel laureates. And that could be part of the reason that we have this. Of course, I like to point out, I don't know, I, I've been giving uh, this talk a couple times to other, other groups of people, and, I, and I, I keep showing this. Maybe you guys will get it. But the back of the Nobel Prize medallion, if I turn my real Nobel Prize over here, no, if I fake one, you'll find two women, Mother Nature and this goddess known as the genius of science. And she's taking the veil off Mother Nature's face. So it's pretty cool. Uh, but I noticed that like what we really have is that you have a picture depicting two women and they're kind of, you know, wouldn't be having this conversation unless there was a dude there. And so this is an example of a failure of what's called the Bechdel test, if you guys know about that. <laughs> it's a very important scientific test. But it is actually another example of that. So I wrote this book and part of the book, I joke, is about idol worship. <laughs> uh, so in, in physics, there's no greater stature than you can have than to be a Nobel laureate. It's really something that people aspire to. So much so, and I have no problems with the people who have won it, uh, it's more the committee and the structure and the, and the system that I believe has systemic problems that are preventing um, uh, the meritocratic award of prizes. And maybe during Q&A I can address those. This is a, a, a friend, a, a former colleague at UCSD. This is Professor Duncan Haldane. He ended up winning the 2016 Nobel Prize, the one that I was nominating uh, winners of. I did not nominate him. Do not tell him, OK? I did not nominate him, but he won. He actually won with one of my former professors at Brown University, Michael Kosterlitz, and another gentleman. And he came back to UCSD the day I submitted the first draft of this book, Losing the Nobel Prize. In this book, I decry how physicists elevate the Nobel laureates to the status of idols, that they basically are willing to, to you know, kind of sacrifice so much and really to be in awe and, and bask in the aura of the laureates and their Nobel Prize. Look, I took this picture. You can't hardly see the, it glows with a white hot intensity. And it just has a super, you know, this super luminant glow to it. And look how all these students and then the faculty that came up to him. And they were ooing and eyeing and just gushing over him. It was pathetic. I was like, you guys are rational scientists. You're supposed to be the most rational, you know, critical thinkers in all of humanity. How could you stoop so low? It's disgusting that you, oh my god. Somehow, the Nobel Prize gets in my hand, selfie, okay? 
even I, who had been giving this incredible you know, uh, opportunity to assail the Nobel Prize from the inside, to dissect it, and to point out all of its flaws, to, to make it better, uh, succumbed to it. And he's luckily a very wonderful man. I want to close the talk with a couple of uh, points as to what will come next, both in cosmology and in the Nobel Prize, hopefully. So uh, getting back to my theme, dust to dust. We began our talk with dust. Dust came in as a villain. But I want to point out a, a very noble uh, a person by the name of Mahatma Gandhi. And he gave some advice to experimentalists like me in this story called The Story of My Experiments with Truth. Gandhi said, the seeker after truth should be humbler than the dust. The world crushes dust under its feet. But the seeker after truth should so humble himself that even the dust could crush him. Only then, and not until then, will he have a glimpse of truth. And I think that's part of what we need to have as cosmologists and as practicing scientists in general, to look for ways to be humble and have humility in order to strive and make the, the, make the great leaps without focusing on arbitrary awards you know, or accolades, prizes, money, whatever you venerate to the level of, of your idol. So what comes next in science is a huge collaboration. BICEP had 49 people, all, you know, all of which would not have, most of which would not have won the Nobel Prize, even if we were confirmed. Uh, instead, we have a much bigger collaboration building on the lessons of BICEP. BICEP was not a failure. It was one of the most successful experiments in history because it measured signals that are so minute that no experiment has caught up to what we did with BICEP, even after uh, four years after the uh, announcement. So we didn't retract the findings. We retracted what we claimed as the interpretation. We said we saw the fingerprints of creation. We really saw the dusty fingerprints of the Milky Way galaxy. So now we're taking lessons learned. We're building this big observatory in the Atacama Desert of Chile called the Simons Observatory. And this telescope is going to be located. Here's a street view or Google Earth view for you guys out there. And it shows kind of the killer app for this technology is a new type of detector, same kind of superconducting instrumentation, except it uses a fractal pattern antenna. And this fractal antenna has extremely wide bandwidth, frequency coverage, so it can simultaneously measure dust and measure the cosmic signals if they're truly there. And then from the sum of the cosmic signal and the dust signal, we're going to subtract the dust signal. And what we'll be left with, hopefully, is the pristine signal from the early universe. But we won't know until we do it. What's the other part of you know, call to action next in, in the Nobel kind of front? Well, I want to close with the final sentence in Alfred Nobel's will. He said, it's my final request, that after my death, my veins shall be opened. And when this has been done and competent doctors have confirmed clear signs of death, my remains shall be cremated in a crematorium. Why did he want to do this? Well, he was terribly afraid of being buried alive. It was a condition that people were, it's called tapophobia. I Googled that. And, and it means uh, that you're terrified of being uh, buried alive, so much so that in caskets, they used to put bells so that if you were buried alive, you had this you know, intercom system. You could, you could ring the bell, and people would open you up. But I like to point out, you know, if he wasn't dead, and then the doctors opened his veins, that would be kind of the, the coup de grace, right? So he, he would cure his tapophobia right there. But it made me think, we should not be scared of opening the veins on the prize and really examining the depths of what the prize has become. So in the news just this week, these are all headlines from this week, Nobel Prize is all over the headlines. It's great publicity for my book. But, um, but there's a sex scandal rocking the Nobel Prize in literature. There's a financial crimes unit, which is investigating uh, the, Nobel, uh, the Nobel committees. Donald Trump is in the news for uh, potentially being worthy of the Nobel Prize for peace. And, uh, and then there's people that are defecting from the Nobel Committee because they don't want to have a part of it anymore. So it's a very dangerous time. And I claim that if the committee wants to save these prizes, to restore them to the luster, the allure that they once had. In the, you know, so if you, do, um, if you do one of your Google searches on, on the search terms and their popularity over history, what's that called again? You guys should know. Google Trends. So I did a Google Trends, and I looked up uh, Pulitzer Prize versus Nobel Prize. It turned out for the early part of the 1900s, the Pulitzer Prize was much more popular than the Nobel Prize. In fact, the first Nobel Prizes, the winners didn't even show up to get them. Nowadays, 100 million people watch them on YouTube and in person. So they've gotten just exponentially more popular. They're moving into this glitzy new building in Stockholm. It's billions of dollars at stake in the national prestige. So if they want to save it, I've made some proposals in this book. Uh, that I think are very concrete, very well organized. I color-coded the pages in the book. So there's three chapters about the Nobel Prize. So if you don't care about it, you can skip those three colors and kind of choose your own adventure book like we used to use as kids. But I want to use the prestige and the name of the prize to reform it for the better. So we've established a site, which we call um, 
which we call losingthenobelprize.org. And it has the uh, capacity to submit petitions to the Nobel committees to advocate for both rectification of past prizes. Say, this is Jocelyn Bell, who discovered pulsars, radio beacons so bright you can set your watch to them and see them across the galaxy. Her advisor got the Nobel Prize, but she didn't. It's called the Matilda Effect, when a man gets the credit for the discovery of a woman. There's nothing in the Nobel statutes that prevents her from winning the Nobel Prize. Just because her advisor won it, it would seem that if you wanted justice to prevail, she should be allowed to win it. Or what about Ron Drever, who died and didn't win it? Or Vera Rubin, who died just on Christmas Day 2016? Why shouldn't she win it? When physicists say, well, you, can, you can't win it once you're dead, I say, oh, I forgot which law of physics talks about that for the Nobel Prize. And it doesn't. And we shouldn't treat it like a law of physics. So I urge people, if you're interested, uh, after reading the book, um, go to the site, losingthenobelprize.org. You can submit petitions. And I thank you so much for your attention. And I hope that you'll visit us on, online as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. That was amazing. Um, it's a, we're a little bit after time, but if anyone wants to ask a question, we have the ability to do that. So just raise your hand. I can throw something at you. <laughs> uh, so it seems like the early universe has a lot of quantum chaotic effects in it. Do, do you ever see that it's perceivable to simulate potentially with a quantum computer the evolution of the universe yeah so yeah so is it possible to simulate so it turns out in physics most of my colleagues um, and, and friends including uh, professor John Preskill up at Caltech here and people in San Diego um, they tell me that a lot of the, the the power of a quantum computer at least in terms of solving practical problems are towards solving quantum systems so solving Lagrangians or things that are really complicated quantum um, mechanical um, uh, variables and, and and plotting wave functions and things like that so if indeed the universe is described by a wave function or what's called Lagrangian that describes how the energy and transfer of energy took place, then yes, quantum computers could have a revolutionary uh, capability to understand it. I should say, though, that there's a divisiveness in the cosmology community right now, and it's every bit as combative as the old debate between the steady state universe and the Big Bang Theory. So, you know, we don't have a TV show called The Steady State Theory, right? So we have The Big Bang Theory. <laughs> that would be pretty boring. Uh, but the steady state theorists used to hate The Big Bang Theorists for a variety of reasons, but one of which was that you couldn't falsify the Big Bang. You could keep changing the models of the parameters of the theory in order to get what you wanted. Nowadays, there are echoes of that debate in what's called the multiverse, which is a consequence of inflation in, in many models of the inflationary universe. And there's a new type of a variant of the steady state called cyclic or bouncing cosmologies, where our universe didn't have a quantum state. It actually just collapsed from a previous universe, expanded again. What we call that expansion point is the Big Bang. But there's no quantum transition. So in those universes, there's only classical physics at work. And in that case, our classical computers are sufficient to deal with that physics. But nobody's simulated that. With I think people are. No, there are people that are doing it. They're also simulating. Uh, I mean, I've seen on classical computer simulations of um, you know what's called quantum chromodynamic effects, um, the vacuum, and actually understanding how particles can pop out virtually in the vacuum. And I think it's just a matter of time before the first step, in my opinion, will probably be. I mean, somebody out there might already be doing this, but first use quantum computers on the QCD Lagrangians, and then transfer to the vacuum state of the inflationary epoch. I think it's eminently possible. I hadn't thought of that. That's a really good point. Yeah, a couple of questions. Uh, so you talked about the pressure to get scientific results out there to have these major impact uh, press conferences. And it seems that that was part of the issue. Have you given uh, thought to reforming that process as well. Yeah, so I've, I've thought a lot about that, and um, I was gratified to see that, you know, my colleagues that are in the medical school or law schools or whatever, they have to take classes in ethics. That's part of their curriculum. And, and, even, um, and, and, and even people that are, you know, in, in university settings and other cases, they will study ethic, ethics. But uh, in physics, in cosmology, I never have a class in ethics. Um, they barely teach us how to be a professor. Right? So, so, um, so what I would like to see is the ethical implications of making a a, a, an announcement like this. It could have potentially impacted very young people, graduate students and postdocs, and then the, the notion of the retraction. And then oftentimes you hear something called like the Keating effect, 
and then it's debunked, and then it'll be, you know, Keating's grad student. You know, so you'll get the name transferred, and it'll be the, the, the grad student blunder, okay? Um, my grad students never make blunders, uh, but, but nevertheless, a lot of times the power hierarchy must be preserved. And I think the, 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 the perception of science as being purely meritocratic, error correcting, I think it. I think it's a little bit bogus. I think that scientists are a little bit too um, too full of of how they they view themselves. Especially, you know, it's kind of like, well, ethics are easy. You know, we're really smart. We have high IQs. You know, we give the sperm back. No, we don't do that. But but um, but you know, we can we can intuit these laws. But I don't think so. I think you know. So we're actually having a a, a play done in San Diego uh, by the uh, by the the Department of, of of Theater is putting on a play about an ethical dilemma faced by, and I had nothing to do with this, by a physicist who's on the verge of winning a Nobel Prize. I always point out, I think it'd be a really cool play or book, and maybe it'll be my next book. Um, you know, there's four Nobel-worthy uh, discoverers of some you know, cure for cancer or whatever, and then you know, it's a murder mystery because only three can win it, right? So how do you deal with these issues of credit, of priority? In science, it's citations. You guys know this. It's Google Scholar. It's one of the tools we use every single day. And you know, how do you determine who got there first? It's who wrote the first paper and who made the first announcement. And a lot of journals like Nature and Science won't allow you to, to do a press conference until you've had peer review. We bypassed that and we, we open sourced it thinking that it's high time that we get away from the stodgy old journal system that's been around for 200 years. It probably would have been better if we had brought in at least, if not an ethical kind of consultants, but even bringing in your competitors because they're not going to scoop you in a day or two before the results. Sit down, talk about them, vet it, air your dirty laundry, and do so in the scheme of what we ended up doing, which is to understand the universe. We actually ended up working with our arch nemesis at the time, which is this Planck satellite. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so my question is related to that question. Okay. So I want to know what do you think about the true impact of Nobel Prize on science? Like, would there be less or more scientific advancement if there was no Nobel Prize? Yeah, so it's interesting. So I've been getting two different types of comments. One is that, oh, you have sour grapes, you're a sore loser. And you know, I point out, well, like a lot of the book is written about women in science and minorities in science, and you know, I'm not a woman in science, right? So and, and kind of advocating for past injustices to be rectified. Um, and then a lot of other things are saying, well, no, the Nobel Keating's right, because the Nobel Prize is so superlative that people, even the last year's Nobel Prize winner, he called the Nobel Prize uh, the original sin in physics. In other words, it was the thing that was responsible for making so many premature announcements about the discoveries of gravitational waves earlier, even earlier than our discovery in the 70s. And so, um, and, and then there are people that say, you know, they really do venerate. I mean, we're taught, I was talking with, with Keith, I think, about that. We're taught the history of physics, really. We don't know it. And, and when I teach my undergraduates, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching them, here are all these Nobel-worthy you know, things that we discovered. You know, that's not my intention. I just say, well, here's the Michelson-Morley effect, or here's the you know, Feynman path integral effect. And, and I go through it, and then you look back and say, all those are Nobel Prize. But that's not the way science goes. Science proceeds forward in history. Looking back in history, OK, that was the wrong turn that they could have avoided. So I think there is this excess emph emphasis placed on the Nobel Prize. I think many scientists, much more you know, uh, kind of even keeled than, than myself, they're able to, to not even care about it. And that's kind of the place that I'm at now. People say, well, you wouldn't, you know, you, you wouldn't turn it down. And I say, well, try me. You want to see if I'm sincere? <laughs> Offer me the Nobel Prize next year. <laughs> but in reality, I think it influences some people. Just like I always say, the Academy Awards, I don't think you guys are here in the Hollywood area, right? So I don't think any actor or actress says, my whole goal in life is to win an Oscar. Because you know, you're going to be one of 150 million women that can win the you know, Oscar each year. But the, you better believe that the movie studios want you to win an Oscar. And they want every single, you know, except for you know, whatever, Weekend at Bernie's 9. But, but you know, they invest in it. And, be, and who are the analogs of the movie studios in science? The National Science Foundation, NASA, the Department of Energy. The, you know, so all these three-letter agencies, four-letter, they all want, and if you go to their websites and Google on their websites, it's, you'll find it instantaneously. Here are all the Nobel laureates, and including you know, places like laboratories and private industries. So it's a very big, it's a subtle pressure, and, and you definitely receive it. Thank you. I think that's all we have time for. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming.